Welcome to the Juniper Connected Security SRX module. This module provides an overview of the Juno's operating system and its basic architecture. This module also explains traffic processing and logical packet flow on an SRX series device. This module also describes the Juno's JWeb UI and its features. This module then lists and shows how to perform initial configuration tasks. Finally, this module describes how to perform basic interface configuration tasks. At the end of this module, you will be able to Describe the Juno's operating system and its basic architecture. Explain traffic processing and logical packet flow on an SRX series device. Describe the Juno's JWeb UI and its features. List initial configuration tasks. Perform initial configuration tasks. Perform basic interface configuration tasks. The Juno security platforms incorporate standard Juno's OS functionality and bring new security capabilities to the Juno's OS, such as stateful processing, application layer gateway or ALG functionality, IPsec VPNs, and more. Juniper Network's world-class intrusion detection and prevention or IDP technology is also fully integrated. Over time, other services have been added, including Unified Threat Management or UTM and AppSecure. A major benefit to the Juno security platform is its flexibility, not only in features but also scalability. All Juno security device models share a common code base but each line is targeted at different segments of the market. The hardware supporting the Packet Forwarding Engine, or PFE, reflects the biggest difference between models. The PFE handles the majority of the security processing, and due to the differences in implementation, 100% feature parity is difficult to maintain and not always necessary. The smaller models were designed to do a little bit of everything. Routing, switching, stateful processing, VPNs, network address translation or NAT, UTM, IDP, and more. The goal is to provide a variety of features, but they cannot match the scalability of the high-end models. The high-end models are designed to handle a greater amount of traffic at higher speeds. The larger models provide faster performance, higher session maximums, and a modular chassis design to ensure that the hardware meets the requirements of the network. The Virtual SRX, or VSRX, is a recent addition to the series. As data centers increasingly rely on server virtualization, the VSRX offers the same capabilities as the physical platforms, but for virtualized and cloud environments. Juno's security devices share various common features, such as the Juno's OS, packet-based features, session-based features, application layer security, robust, modular, and scalable. Click each feature to learn more. Juno security devices implement the same separation of the control plane and forwarding plane as implemented on other Juniper devices for better performance and administration. Click each plane to learn more.
Transit traffic, which consists of all traffic that enters an ingress network port, is compared against the forwarding table entries and is finally forwarded out an egress network port toward its destination. A forwarding table entry for a destination must exist for a device running the Juno's OS to successfully forward transit traffic to that destination. Transit traffic passes through the forwarding plane only and is never sent to or processed by the control plane. By processing transit traffic through the forwarding plane only, platforms running the Juno's OS can achieve predictably high performance rates. Transit traffic can be both unicast and multicast traffic. Unicast transit traffic enters one ingress port and is transmitted out exactly through one egress port toward its destination. Although multicast transit traffic also enters the transit device through a single ingress port, it can be replicated and sent out through multiple egress ports depending on the number of multicast receivers and the network environment. Unlike transit traffic, exception traffic does not pass through the local device, but rather requires some form of special handling. Examples of exception traffic include packets addressed to the chassis, such as routing protocol updates, telnet sessions, pings, trace routes, and replies to traffic sourced from the RE, IP packets with the IP options field. Options in the packet's IP header are rarely seen, but the PFE was purposely designed not to handle IP options. Packets with IP options must be sent to the RE for processing. And traffic that requires the generation of Internet Control Message Protocol, or ICMP, messages. ICMP messages are sent to the packet source to report various error conditions and to respond to ping requests. Examples of ICMP errors include destination unreachable messages, which are sent when no entry is present in the forwarding table for the packet's destination address, and time to live, or TTL expired messages, which are sent when a packet's TTL is decremented to zero. In most cases, the PFE process handles the generation of ICMP messages. The Juno's OS sends all exception traffic destined for the RE over the internal link that connects the control and forwarding planes. The Juno's OS rate limits exception traffic traversing the internal link to protect the RE from denial of service or DOS attacks. During times of congestion, the Juno's OS gives preference to the local and control traffic destined for the RE. The built-in rate limiter is not configurable. There are two main types of processing of packets. Packet-based processing, session-based processing. Click each processing type to learn more. Some Juno security device models can operate in what is known as packet mode. This disables session-based processing for some or all packets, depending on the configuration. It will be unable to provide any services provided by the flow module, such as stateful firewall processing, NAT, VPNs, UTM, IDP, or advanced security services. When placed into packet mode, the Juno security device will operate like most Juniper routers. It will be able to provide some services, such as stateless processing, stateless firewall filters, COS, MPLS, IPv6 inspection bypass, and IP encapsulation. Note here that on high-end Juno security devices, stateless firewall filtering is performed on the IOC, whereas stateless firewall filtering on smaller Juno security devices occurs on the CPU. To operate only in packet mode for IPv4 and MPLS traffic, use the command set security forwarding options family MPLS mode packet based. Due to the MPLS header coming right after the Ethernet header, it applies the setting to the INAT family as well. 
The diagram shows the packet flow for packet mode. Packets coming into the Juno security device pass through a policer and an inbound stateless firewall filter if configured. Next, a route lookup is performed to determine the egress interface for the packet. Notice that the packet does not participate in any of the stateful services in the flow module, which provides the session-based security features unique to the Juno security platform. Once the egress interface for the packet is determined, an outbound stateless firewall filter can be applied, as well as a traffic shaper. Then the packet is forwarded out to the next top interface. The main job of a router is to forward packets to the correct destination based on routing information. Stateless firewall filters, also known as ACLs or packet filters, are one way of controlling and monitoring traffic entering and leaving a router. Firewall filters are stateless in nature and evaluate every packet independently of traffic flows or sessions. Firewall filters can match most header fields and the three basic actions are to accept, discard or reject the packet. No session information is kept by the router on the state of these connections. You must explicitly enable traffic in both directions for each connection you want to permit. This is in contrast to stateful firewall rules that only require the initial connection to be permitted, which enables bidirectional communication based on expected return flows. Stateful security possesses three features session-based or stateful packet processing, zone-based security, advanced security. Click each feature to learn more. Stateful packet processing involves the creation of a unidirectional flow, which consists of six elements of information. Source IP address, destination IP address, source port number, destination port number, protocol number, and a session token. The session token is derived from a combination of the routing instance and a zone. The outgoing flow generates a session table entry and the expected return flow for that packet. The session comprises both outgoing and incoming flows and are entered into the session table. The session table enables bidirectional communication without any additional configuration steps for return traffic. Juno security platforms handle an incoming packet as follows. When a packet ingresses the device, the software applies ingress stateless processing such as policers, stateless firewall filters, and COS classification if configured. If the packet does not drop, the software performs a session lookup to determine whether the packet belongs to an existing session. The Juno's OS matches on six elements of traffic information for this determination. Source IP address, destination IP address, source port number, destination port number, protocol number, and a session token. If the packet does not match an existing session, the software creates a new session for it by using first path processing. If the packet does match an existing session, the software performs fast path processing. Based on whether the packet matches an existing session or not, the software creates a new session in two ways of processing. First path processing, fast path processing. Click each processing type to learn more. You now apply the packet flow decision process to a specific example. As the example shows, a host at 10.1.20.5 
wants to initiate an HTTPS session with the web server at 203.0.113.5. The traffic passes through a Juno security device. The example shows the packet as received by the Juno security device on interface GE0-0-1. You can track the progress of the packet through the device by looking at the flowchart. 1. Ingress stateless processing is checked first. In this case, there is no stateless processing. 2. Based on a lookup in the session table, the Juno's OS determines that this packet is not part of an existing session. 3. There are no screen options that match the traffic. 4. There are no destination NAT rules that match the traffic. 5. The forwarding table shows the egress interface used to reach the destination network. 6. Now that the forwarding lookup is complete, the software can determine the ingress and egress zones required for security policy evaluation. Here is a continuation of the progress of the packet. 7. The packet is from host 10.1.20.5 with destination port 443 HTTPS. This packet matches the policy statement for this example. The action for this particular type of traffic is to permit the traffic. 8. There are no source NAT rules that match the traffic. 9. Based on a lookup, there are no additional services or ALGs interested in the traffic. 10. The flow information is added to the session table. At the same time, a return flow is automatically created and also adds to the session table. 11. Outbound stateless processing is not configured in this case. 12. The Juno security device then forwards the packet out interface GE1-0-0 as determined by the destination lookup. The JWeb Graphical User Interface, or GUI, makes configuration of security features very easy. No client software is necessary other than a standard web browser. Anything that can be configured in the CLI can be configured in JWeb. JWeb contains a section called CLI Tools that enables you to directly view or edit the configuration as if using the CLI. It is also possible to type CLI commands directly into JWeb. One major advantage of JWeb over the CLI is the ability to see visualizations for monitoring and maintenance purposes. For example, you can view traffic statistics in a graph format. Configuration changes in JWeb require a commit just like the CLI. Logging into the JWeb is straightforward. Enter your username and password, then click Login. The HTTPS server is enabled by default for JWeb access. It is recommended that you use HTTPS for web management for the best security. Once you configure a device running the Juno's OS for access, you can log in using your web browser. If you configured the system to use an external authentication mechanism such as a RADIUS server, JWeb will also use that mechanism for authentication. Otherwise, it uses the username and password configured on the local system. The JWeb dashboard menu provides a quick glance at system status, ports, alarms, and utilization information. Across the top is the system menu. It provides the host name and model of the SRX, the contact support button, commit menu, user menu, and help options. The contact support button will open your email program with the Juniper support email address pre-filled in. The commit menu will provide drop-down options to commit your candidate configuration. 
It will turn into golden color when the candidate and active configurations are not the same. To log out of the SRX, use the user menu to drop down to the logout option. The last item is a question mark for help. This will take you to online help for the SRX. The chassis view shows the available physical interfaces and their status. The lower half is reserved for a customizable, multi-tab widget display. Tabs across the top of the widgets display groups that you can put the widgets into, so you can prioritize what you would like to see on the dashboard. Available widgets are listed under the blue icon in the middle of the dashboard. Click the icon to open the available widgets. The main menu consists of five options. Dashboard, Monitor, Configure, Reports, Administration. The monitor hierarchy displays detailed real-time statistics and the results of configuration-related activity. From this hierarchy, you can monitor interfaces, routing table, flow sessions, security policies, NAT, and many other options. As seen on the image, the interfaces hierarchy provides statistics in a graphic fashion using colorful charts and graphs. Use the drop-down menus to customize your view. Hovering the mouse pointer over various parts of the interface presents you with more detailed information. From the monitor device hierarchy, some of the options you can view are routing engine information, cluster status and statistics, and Ethernet MAC tables. The Junos OS has many routing tables. This module focuses on the IPv4 protocol exclusively, which is the INET.0 routing table. To view this table, select the monitor, routing, Routing Information Workspace and select INET.0 from the drop-down menu. Many routing tables will be too large to view in this manner to find the pertinent information. At the top of the page are route filters to help reduce the numbers of routes shown to the relevant ones for your task. These filters include Destination Address, Protocol, Next Hop Address, and Receive Protocol. The IPv6 protocol is also fully supported by the SRX series devices, but is outside the scope of this module. The IPv6 routing table name is INET 6.0. The Configure button on the side pane enables you to configure the system in a point-and-click fashion or by a direct edit of the configuration in text format. In addition to basic device configuration, you can configure Juno's security features, including security policies, IPsec VPNs, and NAT. Help is available by clicking the question mark next to the various configuration options. Choose which configuration hierarchy you want to view or edit in the left navigation menu. Information about that hierarchy appears on the main portion of the screen. You can add new configuration options with the Add button or edit existing configuration options with the Edit button. These buttons and a Delete button are located near the top right of the screen. The configuration screens will be used during the presentation and labs to configure the SRX devices. The Reports button on the side pane enables you to generate reports on demand and view them in HTML format. However, you must enable traffic logging to view and generate reports. Generate reports using one of the predefined templates that are available on the page. Simply select the template you want to use and click Generate Report. When the Generate Report button is clicked, a pop-up window will appear that enables you to customize the report. Once a report is generated, it is downloaded to the browser immediately for viewing. This file can then be shared with others. The image shows a few examples of these reports. The Administration button on the side pane provides an interface to manage file systems, the Juno's OS, configuration files, several troubleshooting tools, and manage device licenses and certificates. There are four CLI tools to help configure the device. CLI Terminal to type CLI commands directly. CLI Viewer to look at the Juno's Candidate config file. 
CLI Editor to edit the file similar to a graphical text editor, and Point and Click CLI to configure the few features not available in the JWeb. Unlike software from other vendors, configuration changes made in the Junos OS do not take effect immediately. This design feature enables you to group together and apply multiple configuration changes to the running configuration as a single unit. Configuration changes in the Junos OS are of two types, active configuration and candidate configuration, and a configuration file follows a certain life cycle. Click each configuration aspect to learn more. Once changes are made in the candidate configuration, the commit menu on the top bar turns gold in color, signifying that the active configuration and the candidate configuration are no longer the same. Often, users will want to verify the changes before committing them into the active configuration. It is best practice to view the differences when logging in and seeing the gold commit button. There have been changes made before you logged in, and it would be wise to understand what those differences are before you commit the configuration. By using Compare from the Commit menu, you can view the differences between the candidate configuration and the active configuration. The output of the comparison is patch-like and context-sensitive. Thus, instead of showing the entire configuration, the display shows only the actual changes. If there is a negative or minus sign before a line, that particular line will be removed at the next commit. If there is a positive or plus sign before a line, that particular line will become active at the next commit. Remember, Junos devices do not automatically apply your configuration changes. You must commit to activate your candidate configuration. The Commit menu button will turn into a gold color when differences between the candidate and active configurations are present. Click the Commit menu and select Commit to commit your configuration. A pop-up window appears displaying the delivery status of the configuration. Once it is done, it will display Success and you can click OK or the configuration delivery window will disappear after about 4 seconds. What happens when you are configuring a device remotely and make a mistake that leaves that device inaccessible to remote connections? Someone must gain physical access to the device to fix the mistake in the configuration so that you can gain access to it again. You can solve this problem by using the Commit Confirm command from the Commit menu. When you issue a Commit Confirm command, the system starts a timer, during which time it expects to see another commit. Currently, the software supports a timeout range of 1 to 65,535 minutes, with 10 minutes being the default. If a second commit does not occur within the specified timeout value, the system performs a rollback to the last configuration on your behalf. After the automatic rollback, you can load the rollback1 file to look for your mistake. Sometimes changes have been made to the candidate configuration that you do not want to commit into the active configuration. A simple way to reverse the changes made is to discard them. In the Commit menu, there is a Discard option that does just that, by loading the active configuration into the candidate configuration and by selecting Discard to erase the changes you don't want. You can use the Administration, Devices, Config Management, Upload Hierarchy to load a complete configuration from the local workstation. Clicking Upload and Commit completely overwrites the current configuration with the configuration you load and makes it the active configuration. 
the software saves the last 50 committed versions of the configuration. To overwrite the candidate configuration with one of these previously committed versions, use the Administration, Devices, Config Management, History menu options. To return to a version prior to the configuration most recently committed, select the configuration and click Rollback. Also included is a download link to copy the config to the workstation. The oldest committed configuration the software automatically saves is version 49. The rollback command modifies only the candidate configuration. To activate the changes loaded through the rollback operation, issue the commit command. Using compare displays the differences between two configurations. This compare is very similar to the compare on the commit menu but this one enables the comparison of any two of the 50 configuration files. Configuration comparison is patch-like and context-sensitive. Thus, instead of showing the entire configuration, the display shows only the actual differences between the two files. Always refer to your platform-specific documentation and follow the safety guidelines when connecting power and powering on your device running the Junos OS. Once a device running the Junos OS is powered on, and if power to that system is interrupted, the device automatically powers on when the power is restored. In other words, no manual intervention is required for the system to reboot in this situation. The Junos OS is a multitasking environment. To ensure file system integrity, you should always gracefully shut down platforms running the Junos OS. Although unlikely, failure to gracefully shut down the system could possibly leave it unable to boot. As illustrated, go to Administration, Devices, Reboot to gracefully shut down the Junos OS. This command provides options that enable you to schedule the shutdown in a specified number of minutes or at an exact time to specify the media from which the next boot-up operation will use and to log a message to the console and to the messages file. There are three different default configurations of all platforms running the Junos OS, such as the Factory Default Configuration, Branch SRX Factory Default Configuration, other SRX Devices Configuration. Click each configuration to learn more. When you receive a device running the Junos OS from the factory, the Junos OS is pre-installed. Once you power on the device, it is ready to be configured. When the initial configuration is performed, the root authentication must be included. In addition to root authentication, it is also recommended that you configure these items. Host name, domain name, domain name system or DNS servers, time and date, and users. The Junos OS enforces password restrictions. All passwords are required to be no less than six characters and must include a change of case, digits, or punctuation. 
A sample configuration syntax for the initial configuration tasks include these steps. Initial configuration. Configure system identity. Configure date and time. Configure users. Click each step to learn more. Interfaces are primarily used to connect a device to a network. However, some interfaces are used to provide a specific function for the system on which it operates. On platforms running the Juno's OS, several types of interfaces exist, including management interfaces, internal interfaces, network interfaces, loopback interfaces, services interfaces. Click each interface type to learn more. The Juno's OS uses a standard naming convention. Most interfaces have names based on the interface media type, the system slot number in which the line card is installed, the line card slot number in which the interface card is installed, and the port number for the interface card. As shown, the CLI almost always refers to line cards as flexible PIC concentrators, or FPCs, and interface cards as PICs, even though the actual names of these physical components might vary between Juno's devices. For platform-specific information, including details pertaining to the interface naming convention for your specific device, refer to the URL for the technical publications. In typical deployments, the slot and port numbering begins with zero and increments based on the system hardware configuration. The example shows a sample interface name that illustrates the interface naming format. The highlighted interface name is for the fourth physical port number 3 on a gigabit Ethernet interface card installed in the third slot number 2 of a line card that resides on the first available line card slot number 0 of a chassis. Other interface name designations exist that do not adhere to the naming convention as shown. Interfaces with specific designations are created by the Juno's OS and are not directly associated with or dependent on physical interfaces. Here are some examples. LO0, Loopback Interface. AE, Aggregated Ethernet Interface. ST0, IPsec Encryption Interface. And VLAN, VLAN Interface. The Juno's OS also creates a number of internal interfaces. These internally generated interfaces are non-configurable. Here are some examples. GRE, MTUN, IPIP, and TAP. Note that interface support varies between the different Juno's devices. 
For support information, always refer to the technical documentation for your specific product. Each physical interface descriptor can contain one or more logical interface descriptors. These descriptors enable you to map one or more logical, sometimes called virtual interfaces, to a single physical device. Creating multiple logical interfaces is useful in environments where multiple virtual circuits or data link layer connections are associated with a single physical interface, such as in Ethernet VLANs. Some encapsulations, such as the Ethernet switching protocol without tags and point-to-point -point protocol, or PPP, support only a single logical interface, and its logical unit number must be zero. Other encapsulations, such as tagged Ethernet, support multiple logical interfaces, so you can configure one or more logical unit numbers. Each physical interface may have multiple logical interfaces configured. The logical interface is displayed under the physical interface. Expand the physical interface by clicking the plus sign on the left of the interface to display the logical interfaces. Click each interface property type to learn more. After the interface is configured and committed, go to Monitor, Interface, Ports to view the interface to verify link status, IP address, and zone. To get more details on a specific interface, select the interface and click the Details button at the top of the list of interfaces. Welcome to the lab section of this module. This lab demonstrates the configuration tasks typically performed on new devices running Juno's OS. In this lab, you use JWeb to perform initial configuration and basic interface configuration. At the end of this lab, you will be able to become familiar with the JWeb interface, save, delete, and restore a rescue configuration. Perform basic interface configuration. Click the Start button to view a guided demonstration of the lab tasks. Part 1, Loading the Baseline Configuration. In this lab part, you become familiar with the access details used to access the lab equipment. Once familiar, use the JWeb of the VSRX devices to load the starting configuration for Lab 1. Click each step number to view the step. Refer to the Management Network diagram to determine the management addresses of the devices. Access the JWeb interface of VSRX1 using a web browser. Refer to the Management Network diagram for the IP address associated with VSRX1. From the Open Web Browser to VSRX1, log in to the VSRX1 device with Lab as the username and Lab123 as the password. Note that both the name and the password are case sensitive to the Administration, Devices, Config Management, Upload Workspace in JWeb. Click Browse and select the lab1start.config file located in the VSRX1 directory. 
Click Upload and Commit to apply the configuration to VSRX1. Access the JWeb interface of VSRX VR using a web browser. Refer to the Management Network diagram for the IP address associated with VSRX VR. From the open web browser, log in to the VSRX VR device with lab as the username and lab123 as the password. Note that both the name and the password are case sensitive. Navigate to the Administration, Devices, Config Management, Upload Workspace in JWeb. Browse and select the lab1start.config file located in the VSRX VR directory. Click Upload and Commit to apply the configuration to VSRX VR. Part 2 Exploring the JWeb GUI. In this lab part, you explore the JWeb GUI. Click each step number to view the step. Return to the open web browser with VSRX1 and familiarize yourself with the JWeb menus. Mouse over the menu bar on the left and examine the menu options that are available. On the navigation menu, click the Dashboard tab. Click the Monitor tab and examine the options on the left. Navigate to the Monitor, Alarms, 3. Click the Monitor tab and examine the options on the left. Four. Navigate to the Monitor, Alarms, Alarms Workspace, and see if there are any alarm details present. Navigate to the Administration, Devices, Config Management, Rescue Workspace. Click the Set Rescue Configuration link to save the active configuration as the rescue configuration. Confirm the action when prompted. Click the View Rescue Configuration link to display the contents of the recently saved rescue configuration. Return to the Monitor, Alarms, Alarms Workspace and see if there are any alarm details present. 9. Navigate to Monitor, Routing, Route Information to examine the active routes on the device. Part 3. Exploring JWeb Configuration and Administrative Capabilities. In this lab part, you familiarize yourself with the configuration and administrative capabilities available in the JWeb interface. You also identify the key pages that relate to those capabilities. Click each step number to view the step. Click the Administration tab to access the JWeb Administration page. Navigate to the Configure, Users, User Management Workspace. Click the Create button to create a new user named JWeb. To find the new user with the displayed credentials and click OK. Click Save to apply the changes. Click Commit Options at the upper right corner to examine the proposed configuration change and then select Compare. Commit the configuration. Select the JWeb user and click the Delete button to remove the user. Confirm the action when prompted. Save to apply the changes. Click Commit Options and then select Compare to display changes in the configuration. Commit the configuration. 
Navigate to the Administration, Tools, Ping Host Workspace. Enter the IP address of the student desktop, 172.25.11.254 in the Management Network, and click Start to begin the ping. Navigate to the Administration, Devices, Config Management History Workspace. 14. Examine the different config files that have been saved in your history. Select Option 1 and click Compare. Part 4. Configuring Interfaces and Verifying Operational State. In this lab part, you perform interface configuration and verify the operational state of interfaces using the JWeb interface. Click each step number to view the step. Or to the Lab Network Diagram, Initial System Configuration, and configure the listed interfaces for VSRX1. Navigate to the Configure, Interfaces, Ports workspace in JWeb. Select GE0 slash 0 slash 0 and click the Add button to add the logical interface. Specify 0 for the unit. Enable IPv4 address slash DHCP configuration with the Enable Address Configuration option and click the Add button. Specify the 172.18.1.1 IP address with the 30 subnet and click OK. Select GE0 slash 0 slash 1 and click the Add button to add the logical interface. Specify 0 for the unit. Enable IPv4 address slash DHCP configuration with the Enable Address Configuration option and click the Add button. Specify the 10.10.101.1 IP address with the 24 subnet and click OK. Select GE0 slash 0 slash 2 and click the Add button to add the logical interface. Specify 0 for the unit. Enable IPv4 address slash DHCP configuration with the Enable Address Configuration option and click the Add button. Specify the 10.10.102.1 IP address with the 24 subnet and click OK. Filter the interface type based on LO0 and click Go. Select the LO0 interface and click the Edit button. Under Logical Interfaces, click Add. EV4 Addresses and Prefixes, click Add. Specify the 192.168.1.1-32 IP address and prefix and click OK. In the Logical Interface Description box, Type loopback for main routing instance of VSRX1. Click OK. In the Logical Interfaces section, click OK. Click Commit Options and then select Commit to commit the configuration. 19. Examine the interface status for recently configured ports. Expand each configured interface to view more details. You have reached the end of this module. In this module, you learned to describe the Juno's operating system and its basic architecture.
explain traffic processing and logical packet flow on an SRX series device. Describe the Juno's JWeb UI and its features. List initial configuration tasks. Perform initial configuration tasks. Perform basic interface configuration tasks.